And then he yelled, Brandon. And you just started running as fast as you could to these guys. And I was bawling my eyes out crying. Don't let my dad die. Welcome to the Aviation Mentors Podcast, the podcast that takes your dreams of flight and turns it into reality. Sponsored by Strass Financial, financing your flight training. For pilots, by pilots. I'm Brandon Martini, a commercial pilot and flight instructor. And I'm Carson Vasquez, I'm a private pilot. Whether you're a seasoned pilot or beginner with dreams of flight, Aviation Mentors is your source for expert insights, industry trends, and inspiring stories. So fasten your seatbelts and prepare for this incredible journey through the skies. And stay connected with us on social media for exclusive content. And visit our website at www.aviationmentors.com and let us be your co-pilot on this adventure. As you know, we've been practicing this video thing, and this may be the same size as Carson, but it is not Carson. Who do we have today? Austin. Yes, we have Austin. Everyone's heard about Austin. If you've listened to some of our earlier episodes, maybe you've uh, maybe you even heard Austin talk in one of our earlier episodes about him flying the Icon. And uh, Carson, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. He had an option of either doing the podcast with me uh, or visiting his grandfather, uh, who he hasn't seen in a while. Um, that's uh, come up from Mexico. So, of course, uh, we we believe in family first around here at, uh, at Aviation Mentors and at Stratus. Uh, so, of course, Carson picked that, and uh, we're really happy for, happy for him. So, awesome. What day is it today, and why are you here? Why aren't you at school? Today is Wednesday, and uh, it is Juneteenth, which is now a national holiday. And uh, I'm not at school, and I only have two days left, luckily. Yeah, it's really weird. I think he's got two days left, and uh, is your school, are you off on Friday uh, early too, right? Yeah, I think I get off like midday or something. Yeah, what's really funny, Thursday is an early day for him, and Friday he's off early. So he's got literally two more half days of school left uh, of the year, and uh, it's really odd that his school district goes this um, uh, really this late into the season. He doesn't start till mid-September, which isn't very normal nowadays. I know that was normal when I was a kid. I, uh, I started kind of in the middle of September and I got off in the middle of June. But uh, nowadays everyone's getting getting off in May and starting in uh, in August. So he's pretty lucky here. We get to enjoy the, the best parts of summer and not necessarily the cold parts, um, whether whether we're at uh, our house in Florida or visiting in, in California, right? That's for sure. So perfect. Well, today uh, isn't just going to be us talking about him going to school. We wanted to touch base about how things have changed and uh, kind of what my flying journey has been like since day one and some of Austin's experiences uh, regarding that. Uh, there's There's been a lot that's changed um, in the way that I view flying and really enjoy flying. There's different parts of aviation that I enjoy that I that was different for me before. And uh, it's coming up on my 10 year anniversary. I know we talked about that in the past episode, but uh, one of these days, and I really should have looked this up prior to the episode, but uh, one of the days this month uh, in June, uh, 2024 is my 10 year anniversary of getting my pilot's license. Can you believe that Austin? It's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's impressive to me too. I did not think that I would be flying this long. Um, I, everyone thought that this was just a, uh, a phase that I was going through because I tend, I used to at least, I used to like doing things and I just get over them. Right? I mean, I remember the first day when you came home, me and mom were getting ready for bed and you came home and you said, I passed my test <laughs> and we were all so excited screaming. It was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. I remember that house. I remember that day vividly. I know that uh, I used to, when I used to wake up in the morning, uh, when I was, I get goosebumps just even talking about this because it was such a really cool time. Uh, when I was learning to fly, it really took me six months to get my pilot certificate. I took my initial flight uh, like the week after Christmas, I think on like, maybe it was on my sister's birthday, maybe January 2nd or January 5th of, of 2014. I really didn't fly for those first three months because the weather was just atrocious back in 2014. So I started flying really in, in April and May, and then of course in June, uh, getting ready for my check ride. So I really got everything done in around 90 days. So I tell everyone it takes around 90 to 100 days if you get serious about flying even part-time to get your private pilot certificate. But I remember those days, um, and I remember just just really putting my nose to the grindstone and making sure I was able to uh, to study and get ready for that test. And uh, it was really a, a fun time. I remember in that house that you're talking about, Austin, we were on a cul-de-sac, and, and it's it's funny that he can even remember this because I think you were, what, three or four years old when I got my, my pilot certificate. So he was really young, uh, to be honest. He was still even in a car seat. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but some of those core memories that you still remember, and hopefully you'll still remember this in 10 years when you're 23 and not 13, right? 
Um, and if not, I'll have this podcast uh, episode to, uh, to relive part of it. But really, it was a lot of fun because I remember laying in bed and my bed was, I, I had its back against a uh, I guess the window. It didn't have enough room to fit sideways in the room. Exactly. So I had my, my bed against the window and I would wake up and I would just kind of hope and pray that the weather was good enough for me to uh, uh, to be able to, to go flying for the day. And I used to think as a student pilot that if there was two or three clouds in the air, it didn't matter if they were 30,000 feet in the sky or if they were 500 feet in the sky. That meant the weather was too bad for me to go flying. I remember that being a, a funny situation that I look back now because I really didn't understand what VFR was. And I have a feeling this gets overlooked with a lot of students because you hear all these terms and a lot of people just act like they understand them because they've heard them a hundred times. They don't want to sound dumb. And I'm a big proponent of, uh, Austin, do I ever tell you to ask dumb questions? No, you tell me to ask smart questions that you say questions that if you ask question, no question is a dumb question. They're all just educated questions. Yes, that's not exactly how I say it, but that's the gist of it. I say that um, you can ask all the questions you want. If you think they're dumb, you think they're dumb. But at the end of the day, uh, after you ask those quote unquote dumb questions, you will be smart in that area. So don't be afraid of asking those quote unquote dumb questions or, or those questions that are just silly or whatever you may call them, because they may impact you and your flying ability. I couldn't even read an attitude indicator. And, uh, and I didn't know that, that there were little notches on there and they meant five degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees. I didn't understand what any of those markings meant. And to be honest with you, I didn't really understand what they meant until I was almost a commercial pilot. That should be even more scary. Um, or it might've been through the middle of my instrument training. I don't really remember, but it was quite a while. It was after my private pilot certificate. So there's a lot of little things that go kind of unnoticed. And that's why I'm really big on weather. And I'm also big on knowing kind of the markings and and the instruments in the airplane, I think it's really important. And if you're flying a plane with GPS or something like that, it's even more important to understand those things. So, Austin, I don't know if you remember, uh, but after I got my pilot certificate, you're right, it was a great day. Uh, oh, I got to tell you one story when I got my pilot certificate before we go on to that. When I first got my pilot certificate, we, I was with my, uh, my DP and we're doing the ground portion of, uh, of the check ride. And uh, her name was Andrea Eldridge, and uh, I believe she's now retired from being a DP. Now she's flying some Kodiaks or something, which is really kind of cool airplane if you haven't seen one. Uh, and she asked me, "Well, if I want to turn, if I want to correct for yaw, um, do I press on the pedal on the right or the left?" And she put me in a spinny chair and told me to lift my feet off the ground and to act like what it would be. And I showed her fully depressed right pedal <laughs> um, or right right rudder pedal. And uh, so she said, so you'll do this. And she literally took me and spun my chair around in a circle. She said, so you're just going to spin around on the ground or in the air? I was like, no, ma'am, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm just going to press it just this much. And you can, if you're watching this on video, you can see that you can just press it that much and it'll just turn. But no, I did it like this much. And she was like, no, you will spin around in a circle. And, uh, and I've I made kinda, that mistake once or twice, how I pressed it a little too hard and it spun a little too far. I mean, you've done that a few times and just pressed it totally hard. Exactly. So, um, so, but after that, I rented an airplane the next day and I went on my first flight with a passenger. And uh, Austin, I don't know if you remember that, but you were screaming a little bit in the back in your car seat with Ashley and Andrew, my, my sister and brother-in-law, uh, in the plane. And I mean, we only had like 15 or 16 gallons in this 172 or whatever it was for weight and balance. I don't remember at this point. It was literally 10 years ago. I mean, it was scary because it was my first time in a little airplane, I think, and it was... Yeah, you only went in a big airplane, quote-unquote big airplane, a few times, and that was literally your first time in a Cessna 172. I think it might have been Ashley's first time in a Cessna 172, and I don't know if it was uh, Andrew's or not. I know he's got some relatives that fly, so he might have gone up before that, but that was an exhilarating flight, don't you think? Do you remember where we went? I think we went to go eat somewhere. Um... To be honest, maybe you're right. I don't remember. I think we only went to uh, uh, to the practice area, and we just did some like low level, not low level, but like high level maneuvers. And uh, I just showed everybody how to fly. I didn't do any stall. I only really that. remember the one when you got your IFR license. Oh, I remember that. And it was like right before school. We woke up really early. I had my backpack in the back of the airplane. Oh, I remember. We were going to your aunt's or your mom's house or something, I think, when I did that. But yeah, shortly after I got my IFR, we took off from, I think, Corona, right? I 
think I don't even it know. Was what it was Corona. Corona. So let's tell everybody about that experience of yours. So I remember because I was sitting in the front seat and I just saw us go through a cloud and everything was dark. I started crying because I was so scared because <laughs> I've never been that high. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And then we got above the cloud and you could see the sun. And it was really pretty. And it was one of like the most memorable experiences of my life. And I remember that day. Yeah, I remember it clearly too. Um, it was beautiful uh, once you got above the clouds. Um, it was also, that was also my first time calling a separate ground control, like tower, essentially, because we were in an uncontrolled airport, Corona Airport. And at this time, I haven't flown IFR over there in a while, but at, I think it's probably still the same procedures, but I'd have to double check. At this time, you actually had to call uh, Chino Tower or Chino Ground, which you, you actually got signal to do so there, uh, Chino Ground to get clearance, uh, to get your IFR clearance. And then once you pop up, then you have to talk to uh, SoCal Approach. Uh, once you pop up out of the clouds or take off from uh, from Corona Airport, you contact SoCal Approach. And it was my first time ever having to do that. And I also had to file the flight plan over the phone and open my flight plan um, over my over the phone um, while in the cockpit. So there was, a, there was a whole bunch of different things that I had to do this day. And on top of that, it was Austin's first time flying in the clouds. And by the way, there's no... There was no uh, no autopilot on this uh, on this airplane, so we were just we were just hand flying. And as soon as we got up, Austin's right. He started he started crying, <laughs> and and now I'm in the clouds dealing with a, a, a crying child who's distraught, who doesn't know what's going on, uh, who does listen to me, but there's nothing I can do to settle his nerves at the moment. Um, so the only thing I could do is I pressed mute on the uh, on the intercom, so I couldn't hear him. And if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have been able to hear ATC. And I didn't talk to ATC and flying through the clouds. And uh, and we flew, I think we just flew from Corona River something. I, I don't remember what it was. I think that's what it was. And then we got over to the airport and, and dropped it off. And and I believe there was no clouds over there, so we didn't really have to file IFR to get in there. We just had to file IFR to get out of Corona, which happens from time to time. So that was kind of a, a nerve-wracking experience for me and, and for Austin. So... Uh, is there any other uh, fun flights or memorable things that you that you uh, remember uh, from my my pilot journey of starting uh, starting from from no hours to to getting to a flight instructor where I'm at today? Are we also talking about the time that we flew from Oshkosh? Yeah, we can talk about that time. So uh, before I even had my instrument rating, so we're going to go back in time a little bit. Uh, me, Austin, and his mom flew all the way to Oshkosh, and uh, on the way back, um, it was a little bit more tricky to get back. Is that what you're talking about? No, I'm talking about the... Oh, he wants to talk about a different time. Okay, this is post uh, IFR. Um, and me, him, and Darius are are flying out. Darius is one of our friends. He's uh, one of my buddies with the Cherokee 6. Um, and uh, we met him through uh, through through my partner and, and great friend, Rich, uh, at Combo Aero Service. Um, and uh, Darius bought the Cherokee 6, and uh, we weren't taking that to Oshkosh for some reason. Uh, we were taking uh, the twin. We were taking a Baron. Uh, I, I can't remember which Baron it was, but I've had several Barons, and we ended up taking the Baron to uh, to Oshkosh. And we stopped at some little airport in the middle of nowhere. And I remember we went over and we were looking for a crew car. And uh, this was the first airport I ever went to, where you walk in, uh, you just have to use the Unicom frequency, and you can normally get that at a four flight, or or it's kind of probably the same thing. We're stopping for fuel, I think. We're stopping for fuel, but we also got some lunch that day, I believe. So we got uh, over to the airport and we were looking for a crew car. We want to go to town. It's like 20 minutes away to go get lunch, right? Um, and this little airport, it's uncontrolled. It's really pretty small, but it's got a decent, decently long runway. Um, and there's no real facilities here. It's just got kind of one little building with a little flight planning station and a fridge in there for, for waters and the honor system if you want to buy a cup of noodles or something, right? And on the counter, it just has keys to their crew card. And it says, please sign it out and sign it back in. And they just leave the keys on the counter. It was so neat. This was in the middle of Kansas somewhere. And I'm like, oh, this car would be stolen so fast if this was anywhere else. And the keys to the car, <laughs> it was the... I don't remember this. Part. I do. It was a Pontiac Aztec. Um, it was absolutely hideous. Uh, and it was like halfway broken down. And like, I mean, the shocks were busted on this car. It was the worst crew car I've ever had. But... I was grateful because it was free uh, and it was transportation to get to town when there was almost no cell phone signal. 
uh, I think we had like one bar of service and it just was not, was not good. Right. We went to town, we had lunch, we came back and uh, we had like a slight oil, oil leak on the, on the right engine. So we, we took off the kelling and just double checked to make sure it wasn't something major. It wasn't anything major. So we just put a little bit more oil in and cowled it up. Um, but while we were putting oil in and cowling it up, this is what happened. And Austin's going to tell us. So I was just watching the runway, see if any planes would land. A whole bunch of airplanes were coming in, by the way. It was having a great time. And I bet you you were... I think I was six. Six or seven, I think. Well, let me think. That's probably five years ago. You might have been eight, six, seven, eight, something like that. But still, a young kid, not, not, not very old. And this one particular airplane, I think it was, it was a two-seater airplane. It was an RV, uh, like six or seven, I don't remember. Yeah, it was a small little airplane. And I just saw it coming in, and it looked like it was coming in for a normal approach. And then it looked like everything was going fine. And then it just veered off the runway a little bit. And then I just saw it flip and burst into flames. And I yelled to Darius, he, his friend, I said, hey, a plane just crashed, a plane just crashed. And he said, no, 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 it didn't. And I said, look, a plane just crashed. And he said, he said, O-S, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then he yelled, Brandon. And you just started running as fast as you could to these guys. And I was bawling my eyes out crying, don't let my dad die. <laughs> he did. He was saying that. It was it was emotional. And I was like, Austin, stay with Darius. Stay with Darius. And he did. And Darius called 911, stayed with Austin. I just started running. And this is 250-pound Brandon, 240-pound Brandon. I couldn't run very fast. Um, but, uh, but Austin did witness a, uh, an airplane crash. He watched it happen in that young of an age. And luckily, it didn't scare the death out of him or he didn't ever want to fly again. It made me more aware, if so. And that's why it's one of my favorite stories to tell to people. Yeah, it was an impactful one, that's for sure. Uh, I still don't know what caused that crash. Um, I'm assuming maybe they had faulty brakes on one side. I saw the wheels touch. It looks like they like porpoised. So I think what happened was... They came in, did like, they didn't mean to do a touch and go. They just came in too fast, did a touch and go, and then stalled the airplane out kind of in the air and then kind of like stall spun at like three or four feet and and then veered off the runway. That's what I think happened um, because I remember seeing them come in and it looked like they were going to do a touch and go to me and I like didn't look anymore. And also was just watching the entire thing because I was focusing on the cowling stuff. So I started running and I get over there and... Uh, by the time I get over there, uh, there's already like um, people coming with with cars coming over to them, and I see the guy. Uh, there's two guys that get out of the airplane. One crawled out, and I could see like visible burns on him, and the other guy had some small burns on him, uh, but they were both alive, and they both seemed like they weren't going to die or anything like that. So I was really happy to see that they looked like they were going to be okay, and uh, ended up. Uh, uh, ended up getting the fire department over there. They they did all that, and and the guys were fine, and they got hauled off. So it was really a, a an impactful day for me. It was the first time I ever experienced anything like that. And of course, it's the first time Austin experienced something like that, which was which was really impactful. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm not grateful that I that I experienced that, but I was grateful that that those two guys were were okay. And if you happen to, to listen to this uh, this podcast, or if you know who those guys were. Uh, I would love to hear an update on on what happened to them and and, uh, and how they ended up. We ended up leaving that airport about an hour later after the emergency personnel kind of cleared. You gonna say how they tried to shut down the airport? Yeah, after they cleared everything, they, the police officer of the town, because it's a small town, tried to shut down the airport, and I let him know that legally he couldn't do that. <laughs> uh, there was nothing impeding the runway. The wreckage was way off of the runway. Um, they weren't doing it was anything. Like Twenty with that. feet off. Uh, I think it was more like more like 100 feet or 200 feet off it it wasn't it wasn't impeding the runway ntsb wasn't there fa wasn't there there was nobody that could legally shut down the airport and they were trying to tell us that we weren't going to be able to leave for a few days and i said no i don't think that's going to happen unless you can show me regular regulations that show that you have the power to shut down an airport so after everything was cleared the guys were like you're not taking off And, and i said i think i think we legally have the ability to take off and at the time i looked up regulations and and I found that we did, and uh, I shared that with the with the officer, and, uh, and he reluctantly let us take off. 
Um, but uh, but I wasn't going to stay in this little town for for a few days um, under the authority of somebody who doesn't have any authority. So now, if he would have, I would have totally respected his wishes, and we would have we would have stayed there. Or if uh, FAA was there or NTSB was there, whoever had the authority to shut down that airport and put a no tam that the airport was closed, um, I would have been very happy to oblige. But this gentleman did not have that ability, and it wasn't impeding safety of, of flight for them or us or anybody else. So we ended up taking off. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was an impactful uh, day, Austin. It really was. Next thing I kind of want to talk about is uh, first time you went in a seaplane. Do you remember that? I went in a seaplane without you, and it was my first time. Oh, really? Well, I'll tell you about my first seaplane ride, and then I'll tell you about yours, and then you can tell about yours. So my first seaplane ride was uh, when I went and got my single-engine sea. Um, at the time, it was called Lake Havasu Seaplane. A guy named Mo Martin uh, was my instructor. I've tried to look up Mo, but he's an older guy when I got my, my rating several years ago, and um, I'm hoping he's still around today. If anybody knows Mo, uh, tell him Brandon Martini says hi, and he was a great instructor. I would love to uh, see him again if he's if he's hopefully still around and he's still flying. I know he's not doing anything in, in Lake Havasu and he was doing a lot of things in the, in the Northeast. He was from New England. Uh, so I'd love to, to chit chat with him again sometime and maybe even visit in the Northeast because I know he went there during the summer when it was way too hot in Lake Havasu. Uh, but the first time we took off Amphibious 172 and I remember just heading towards that water and uh, I could not imagine uh, how kind of nerve wracking it was because I've always heard of like ditching in the water as a, as an emergency procedure. And I've had how many landings, but well over probably a thousand landings at that point on land. And it felt so unnatural. I was nervous landing in this water the first time. And it was a little bit different type of landing and I didn't know what to expect. To be honest, I, uh, I was, it was nerve wracking after we stopped in that water, it changed my life. And uh, everyone knows I now have the Icon A5, and it's one of my favorite types of uh, landings, water landing. So it really was a blast that first time I landed on water. So, Austin, yeah, I remember you went up with your aunt, I think, uh, yeah. up to Seattle. I was in Seattle, and we were going because there's not really a way to get to a different, like, island Seattle without taking the seaplane. It's the fastest way. Instead of, like, a four- or five-hour drive, it was the fastest way to get there. So we took a seaplane. I remember hopping on the plane, and it, like... It felt weird kind of floating on water. I didn't feel like super unnatural, like you said. I, I mean, because I was in a pontoon plane. I don't know if you were in a pontoon scene plane or not. Did it have, it had floats on the ball? Yeah. yeah, it was the same kind. Yeah. So I just remember watching the water, just like it plow through the water. And that was super weird for me. Just seeing the water like make way for the floats. And it was super weird for me. Is that a takeoff? Yeah, that was. Do, do you know what Do you know what that uh, the technical term for that is? When you put put power on and and you're 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 about to kind of start taxing. Do you know what that's called? Um, I had it. It's called plowing, just like you just said. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's called plowing. That's uh, you have to plow through the water, which is funny that you use that term. I know he didn't know that, so that's why I wanted to kind of see if maybe he did. It's called plowing, and then you get on the step, and there's a little little step. The step is what I was looking for. Yeah. So after you plow, then you get on the step and then you can kind of take off after the hydrostatic drag kind of eliminates and you're able to get off the water. But go ahead. And then while you're up in the air, it is weird kind of not seeing wheels instead of seeing floats. And then when we were coming for a landing, I was looking and I'm like, that's not ground, that's water. And I felt like, I know when you like jump from a high place where water feels like concrete, so I'm like, what is going to happen here? How is this going to work? And then we landed. It was very smooth, and it was a weird experience for me. But and now I love water landings and anything to do with water. To this day, water, like, being the icon and stuff and landing in the water is a little scary for me, but not as bad. Austin's, Austin's like a fish. He's, he definitely gets that after me. Uh, his mom doesn't really like water that much. Matter of fact, she hates the beach and sand and stuff, but, uh, hate to. but also, and I love the beach. I love the water and love going paddle boarding and love going on the boats. And of course we love seaplane fly, um, which is very, very cool. So, um, I'm glad you took that part of me, uh, because, uh, cause that's a lot of fun. I love water. Yeah, I do too. And swimming and, and uh, scuba diving. Um, I just, I don't know if we've talked about it, but a lot of pilots scuba dive. Um, I've noticed that over the years. And I was always wondering why pilots scuba dived, and it was never really an interest to me until recently. Um, maybe six months ago, I started to get the interest, and 
um, just a week or two ago, I maybe three weeks ago, I finally got my scuba certification. Austin just has to be one more skill, um, which he's going to do on the 30th of this month. Right, Austin? Yeah. And once he gets that skill done, he'll be certified too. He worked hard on that written test for like three or four months because the scuba instructor we have uh, made us get 100%. Um, so it took me a while and it took him a while to get that written part done. But finally, we both passed that, luckily. And now all he has to do is pass the skills test. You gotta rip off the mask and, and regulator in the water. And then after you put it back on, you can officially say you are certified. So then we can go, uh, we can go take the icon with our scuba equipment. If weight balance will let us go land on the water, go scuba diving somewhere and then pop back up and, and head home. I've That'd be cool to back roll off the back roll off this, the icon. Oh, uh, I don't think we could probably do that, but I think we probably could take our gear, beach it, and then tie it off at the beach so the plane doesn't fly away. And then we can do a beach um, a beach entry. That could be uh, pretty, pretty cool. I've seen people do spear fishing out of the icon. That's pretty cool. So instead of spear fishing, we'll go scuba diving. That would be epic. Maybe we'll go snorkeling with that little uh, handheld tank that you have. That'd be cool too. Does it have power outlets? Uh, no, no power outlets. We'd, no. we'd have to like get a battery or something. I don't know how we'd do that. I'm sure it's possible. A mini generator something. Yeah, mini generator out. We'll figure that out. That's possible. Uh, also, are there any other flights you want to, that you have a good memory about that are really kind of cool? Uh, the sketchiest takeoff of my life. Yeah, what is the sketchiest takeoff of your life? It would airport in the middle of nowhere. We're either we're your takeoff or my takeoff. Your takeoff. Oh, okay. And we're going to Oshkosh, I think. And I mean, I have a lot of memories going to Oshkosh, but I remember this one. We were taking off, there was a ton of headwind, and we are taking off from this tiny airport. Mom was in the passenger seat, I was in the back, and you were in the front. And we were taking off, and it felt like the plane was just sitting there in the air, hovering. And we were about to slide back. I don't remember which uh, time that was, because I've done a lot of those, where if you've got a really strong headwind, it's a really gusty times. But it really felt like it was like the plane was almost like straight up in a sense. And it, it was terrifying. That was yeah. like my first like really strong headwind takeoff. And it was. Oof. Yeah. Just remember if you're, if you're working with an airport that has really strong winds, if it's a headwind, it's not really that dangerous as long as when you taxi, you're taxiing properly. And when you take off, you're just going to need a lot less runway. And uh, it's just, that's how it's going to work because you're going to have all this headwind towards you. And your ground speed might be like 10 knots that you take off with. If you have 50 knots of headwind and your takeoff speed's 60, your ground speed will literally be like 10 knots. If you're ever in that situation, then you, you really need to be careful when you make turns. Make sure you turn like when you get higher and not really low to the ground because if you accidentally dip that wing, it could cause you to kind of spin, not an aerodynamic spin, so stuff like that. So uh, I actually remember one other, one other flight, and then we're going to kind of wrap it up for the day, Austin. But... Uh, when we were coming back from Oshkosh, and I know we're talking about all like really old flights. Uh, there's a lot of really, a lot of newer flights that I'm sure we could kind of talk about. But, but these are some fun ones that we did back when you were you were younger. On that, that same trip from Oshkosh that we did, I think it was our first trip in the 172 in 2015 or 2016. I remember what it was. Um, but on our way back, we stopped at I don't know what airport it was, but it was in like either South Dakota or. Wyoming. I think it was in Wyoming. I'm not positive. I remember uh, something you talking about an airport in Wyoming. I think it was in Wyoming. I, I don't remember which airport. It was a large airport in Wyoming. And the wind was, was really strong, um, but it was at a slight angle. But the wind was like, like 40 or 50 knots and there were no other airports we can go to. Um, but it was straight on. So we could take off. We could land and we could take off. And it was pretty much straight down the runway. Uh, it wasn't coinciding with a small airport. It was coinciding with this really big airport. So that was a lot of fun um, landing there because our landing speed was literally like 18 knots or something on the ground speed, of course, not on indicated. Indicated, we would have been solid by then. So uh, we did that, and then uh, we parked that airplane. I think we stayed there overnight because the wind was just so strong. Uh, but honestly, I had to like hold the plane with the brakes into the wind um, while waiting for some of the people to... Um, to come and like tie down the airplane and put put chocks on it because I want the plane to go fly away um, while we were there because it'll just I don't take remember this one. No, maybe you could have even been sleeping for this. You you slept on a lot of airplanes, especially back in those early days. 
So but that was a fun one for me. I mean, it's it was a direct headwind, so it wasn't that bad. But I remember just little gusts coming from the side that made it a little bit more challenging. So there's also a few other times where I've had to deal with crazy wind. I know I, I did one in the Icon on the way home from Texas, which was absolutely insane. I was in... Uh, I remember a time in the Icon where we were almost sideways going into the going to go land in Long Beach. Oh, that's every time I land the Icon in Long Beach. Literally, every single We're time I land. Sideways. Yeah, you have to land sideways and then kick the rudder at the, the tail end because um, I don't know what's changed, but over the years, I'm, I'm assuming when they built Long Beach, like the wind went in those directions and I don't know what's changed, like topography or if... If you're really at like, if you're watching this on video, you're at like this amount of angle going in. Yeah, and he's talking about like 45 degrees or something. So if... Uh, I. I'm not sure what's changed, but normally when they build airports, they build them. So the relative wind is, is kind of typical for like the runways are typical for the relative wind. And for some reason, I feel like you're always taking off with like a quartering tailwind or a uh, like a total crosswind, not even like partial crosswind, like complete crosswind. So I don't know what's going on with Long Beach, but it's a fun little airport. It's a great airport to learn how to um, you know, take off over there every once in a while. So. Cool. Well, uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Do you have any final comments for everybody or any, any pro tips for those kids that are going to be flying with their, their, their moms or dads? Just have fun and listen to your parents. Yeah, absolutely. I have to agree with that. Listen to your parents. Don't touch the things you're not supposed to touch. And, and, uh, unless they tell you. Yeah, unless they tell you to, of course. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much for, uh, for listening. And, and if you're watching today, watching the podcast, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, don't forget to uh, hit like, subscribe, follow, any of those things on whatever uh, platform you're either listening or streaming us on uh, or watching us. You know, i got to add that now, watching us on. So thanks so much for, for listening. If you want to reach out to me, uh, my email is brandon at aviationmentors.com or for Carson, it's carson at aviationmentors.com or to be a guest on our show uh, or reach out to, uh, to us regarding any technical difficulties, etc. Please reach out to our producer, Mark. It's producer at aviationmentors.com. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, as Carson always says, fly safe and enjoy the ride. Bye.